Our message today, focused on a passage of the Word of God, is entitled, It's Not Your Battle. And I hope in a few minutes it will become clear why it is titled that. In April of 1995, the CEO of Chrysler Corporation was in New York City for the big auto show there when he got an urgent phone call from HQ back in Detroit summoning him back for an emergency meeting. And so he quickly canceled a speech he was scheduled to give in New York and boarded the corporate jet. What had happened was that CNBC, the financial channel, had just announced a hostile takeover attempt of Chrysler by a quirky billionaire named Kirk Kerkorian, who owned a bunch of Hollywood movie studios and about half of the real estate in Las Vegas. And for whatever reason, this billionaire decided he wanted to own Chrysler. And more shockingly, in his corner as his top advisor was no less than Lee Iacocca, the guy who had been Chrysler's CEO during difficult times a decade earlier and had brought them through bankruptcy and recovery. And now Iacocca was seen in Detroit as the biggest Benedict Arnold of them all. Well, the CEO and the top brass were absolutely in panic mode, and they lawyered up to the max, and they brought in all these high-priced investment bankers and advisors, and they went into uh, combat mode, and they fought, and they battled, and they strategized, and they put all their time and energy into figuring out how to defeat this hostile takeover attempt, and they were firing press releases back and forth, and it got really nasty and it dragged on for a while and it totally consumed the managers of Chrysler to the point that they sort of stopped worrying about, oh, making cars and were focused upon all this finance stuff. And although ultimately Kerkorian and Iacocca withdrew their bid, the process so weakened and compromised Chrysler that they were sitting ducks to be picked up by the Germans of Daimler-Benz. Do you remember that? The Germans ran Chrysler for a while and pretty well ran it into the ground, skimming all of the profits, allegedly, and shipping them back to Stuttgart or wherever, and leaving Chrysler so weakened that when when uh, the uh, Mercedes people could no longer milk it any further, they turned it over with government assistance to the Italians of all people. And thus what we have today is one of the great icons of corporate American industry is now no longer an American corporation. And it all happened, I believe, it can all be traced back to a failed strategy for resisting a hostile takeover, okay? Well, what we're going to be reading about in the Bible is another attempted hostile takeover. This one happened almost 3,000 years ago, and it's recorded for us in the book of 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament, and we find once again an embattled CEO dealing with this threat, but uh, this... CEO handles it in a very different way than Chrysler's. His name is King Jehoshaphat, and he is the king of the Jewish people. And a horrific threat has just appeared on the horizon. And so we're going to begin reading this dramatic story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 with verse 1. Please follow along on uh, the screens as we read the account. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, and understandably so, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. 
The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, this was his prayer, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Well, that's how Jehoshaphat, the embattled CEO, initially responds. He does not lawyer up. He does not go to DEFCON 5. He doesn't scramble all the militia and get ready for battle. His first reaction is to pray. He seeks the Lord. Isn't this a dramatic example? Seeking God, not as the last resort after you've tried every other thing, but rather as a first resort. And notice also that when Jehoshaphat begins his prayer, taking his needs to the Lord as his first resort, he does not begin with, okay, God, here's what we need you to do. But rather he begins with praise. God, you are so great. You made the earth. You rule the nations. You are the one who has all power. Why does he spend the first part of his prayer in praise? Ah, because of the power of praise. This is what we've been doing for the last few minutes as we begin our worship. Why do human beings need to praise God? Acknowledging and remembering who he is and what he's done, why is that important? It's certainly not because God needs to boost his ego and feel better about himself. It's because we need to praise God so that we are reminded of who he is and given the right perspective on the world that God's still on his throne and renewed in our faith and confidence in the one to whom we speak. That's why we begin our worship gatherings as Jehoshaphat did that urgent national prayer gathering with praise. But now let's go on and see what he goes on to say. We'll, we'll move down from a, a few more verses of praise to verse 10. But now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. This was years before. So they, that is the uh, people of Israel, turned away from them and did not destroy them. In other words, these guys from Ammon and Moab and so on only exist because of God's mercy and not wiping them out earlier. Verse 11, see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. My friends, that's real prayer. Not going to God and saying, okay, here's the plan. Here's what I want you to do. But rather saying, I don't know what your will is, but I will fix my eyes on you. I will be faithful and trust in you. That's real prayer. And that is exactly what King Jehoshaphat does and we are dealing with this text, not just because it's an interesting story from the past, but because I am convinced that in everybody's life, there will be some battles. And why are we thinking about how to deal with the battles, the struggles of life? Because we all have them. We all have and we all will yet have our struggles, our battles to face. And they come in a wide range of different flavors and styles. We deal with many different types of enemies. Some of them are literal enemies. 
like King Jehoshaphat, had to face. Some of them are of an emotional kind, struggling with discouragement or depression or fear or worry. Some of them are physical, microscopic illnesses or mutating cells that threaten us. Some of them are relational, a rupture in a family, a breakdown in communication, a, a friendship shattered. Some of them are financial. Some of them are work-related. We face enemies. We have to go into battle from time to time in life. And that's why it's good to learn from others who have fought in the right way. In fact, I read recently that um, a, a baker in Colorado by the name of Jack Phillips, maybe you've heard his story, he was horrifically persecuted by bureaucrats in his state who attacked him and tried to deprive him of his rights to live out his faith. And of course he had to fight for several years all the way till he was finally vindicated at the Supreme Court. And Jack Phillips stated that this story was his favorite portion of the Bible as he went through that long battle and he drew his strength and encouragement from it. So let's take a look at what it has to say to us. And as in this passage, we find King Jehoshaphat saying, Lord, these enemies are far more and far stronger than we are. And left to ourselves, we're not going to make it. So it is important to remember that acknowledging our weakness is good because as the apostle Paul said when we're weak but trusting in God we become strong and this is exactly what King Jehoshaphat models for us admitting as we all do that there are times when we face enemies and opposition and problems that are bigger than us acknowledging that rather than living in denial I can handle it no problem I'm tough I'm strong I'm smart Acknowledging that we need God is a step to unleashing his power in our lives, as it will be in this story. So let's continue. As we go on, we find, uh, turning to verse 14, then the Spirit of the Lord came on, and by the way, whenever you find in the Old Testament this phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came on somebody, that means God anointed for that moment that person to be a prophet and speak directly the words of God. So the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. Obviously, these people were really into their genealogy. And this was long before 23andMe and any of that stuff. I mean, these guys really cared about who your granddad was and so on. So we find that this guy, Jehaziel, or Jehaziel, is inspired by God to speak directly the word of the Lord to the people. And here's what he says, verse 15. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They'll be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you'll find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Now do you see why I'm entitling this chapter of the Bible, It's Not Your Battle. Listen again to verse 15. For the battle is not yours but God's. And again in verse 17. 
Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Oh my, what a powerful word of encouragement to those folks who were in a seemingly tough spot. Now, this story, promising that when the battle comes, God's going to be there and is going to fight with them and for them, is such an encouragement. And in fact, it's one of those in the nick of time stories that we love so well. You know, that's a common theme in literature and in movies. Think back to the old westerns. John Wayne is accompanying the wagon train and the wagons have to circle up because the enemy is attacking and just before it seems that all is lost, what should appear on the horizon but the cavalry in the nick of time. And think of how many other stories reflect upon help in just when it's needed. Do you remember the uh, first of the Indiana Jones movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Indy's exploring at the opening of the film in this, this old uh, abandoned temple in the jungle of Central America. And he, he takes the jewel and, and then everything starts to go wrong and he's running for his life and, and the natives are throwing spears at him and Indy races towards a lake and just in the nick of time, a float plane pulls up and he's able to climb in it and fly away to safety. And it happens again and again. I mean, in Star Wars and in, in Lord of the Rings and in Harry Potter over and over again. We love these stories, don't we? We love the story about everything seeming lost and then just at the right moment, help arrives. That's what is described here. It's a great story. It's a thrilling one. I would hope some Hollywood producer would make a film of it, but maybe not. Nevertheless, it's really great to be encouraged that God is there when we need him the most. But oh, I want to notice this point. God does not say, it's going to be my battle. I'm going to fight for you. So relax. Stay at home. Binge watch your show on Netflix, play some solitaire, take it easy, you don't need to do anything, I'll handle. God does not say that. He tells them, in fact, strap on your armor, get yourselves into your squadrons, march out, get in position, be ready as if you're going to fight, and then watch. That's what God tells us, not to be passive, not to be disengaged, not to be lazy or to uh, be in denial, but rather to do what we can, trusting that then God will do what only he can do. And that's what we find here, that the people have done what they can do, but they've also surrendered the outcome to God's will and God's hand. This is one of the great paradoxes of life. We might think that to surrender is the opposite of victory. But in the spiritual sense, surrendering to God actually is the way to victory. And these people have put themselves in God's hands and thus they are ready for him to fight for them. I, I've had the, the great privilege of being allowed into the lives of many of our most valiant cancer warriors in this congregation. People who have fought against that bitter, terrible enemy of that disease. And I have had the privilege of sharing with them as they have turned to the Lord, surrendered the outcome and their own selves into God's hands and then fought the good fight. And I have uh, not too long ago had the opportunity to talk with one of our cancer warriors who said to me, Doug, I think I've got the best doctor and I'm convinced that we have determined the best thing known to medical science to do and I'm going to throw myself completely and unreservedly into my therapy regimen and I'm all in and I and my family are going to fight this disease but I've also completely put it in God's hands and will trust in him. The outcome is not up to the doctors and it's not up to those multiplying cells. It's up to God and I am secure to know it's in his hands. 
Well, now we go on to the rest of the story, and I'm sure you're eager to hear how it ends. And rather than read it, because it's kind of long in the Bible, let me just give you a quick synopsis. Indeed, on the day of the battle, the people of Israel walk out there, and they take up their positions. And then God acts. Now remember that the enemy arrayed against them consists of an uneasy alliance of three different countries, warlike people who had often fought with each other, and they had decided to ally together in order to defeat Israel and, and get all of the loot. But every alliance is tricky to manage and hold together. Ask General Dwight Eisenhower about that. It was not easy to keep the allies together in the Second World War. And this particular alliance is on very shaky ground. And so God starts to work by causing them to begin to quarrel with each other. I don't know, some guy from Moab must have said something to some guy from Ammon, or maybe they were trash talking, or maybe one guy tripped over the other guy's spear and took it personally, but some kind of a fight began, and then it built, and you know how it is in those old westerns where uh, the bar fight starts, and somebody gets mad at somebody else, and pretty soon everybody's throwing chairs and smashing bottles and stuff. Well, this was one of those rip-roaring, spontaneous bar fights, and it really got out of hand, and sure enough, those three armies started fighting each other in the camp and they wiped each other out. <laughs> and the, the people of Israel are watching this. After a while, all the commotion in the camp dies down. Nothing's happening. Nothing's moving. And they decide to check it out and they find that they're, they're all gone and the only thing left is the plunder. It was an amazing victory, quite a thrilling story. Now, sometimes God works in that kind of remarkable way. Sometimes a problem that seemed unsolvable is resolved, and we're amazed. But before we close, I want to speak with realism to you from my own opportunity over 40 years to observe and witness the battles of life that so many of the people in my congregation have gone through personally. And I want to offer to you these three principles that I think are valid and true for fighting the battles of life. Principle number one, be prepared for the battle to take longer than you expect or think it will. Be prepared. I know how impatient we get. What's wrong, God? I, I prayed and I asked you to solve this problem and now, mm, clock's ticking. Because our attention and our time frame is so short in comparison to God's that at times it seems as if he's awfully slow. But if we prepare ourselves that a struggle may be long, we will be better able to endure it. Think of it as more marathon-like than sprint-like. I'll give you an example of a group of people who persevered all the way longer than they ever thought they'd have to. Joshua Chamberlain, a colonel in the uh, Union Army, was uh, the commander of a regiment called the 20th Maine. On July the 2nd, 1863, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the most critical battle of the Civil War was raging. Chamberlain's small group of soldiers were given the crucial role of holding a little hill called Little Round Top at the far left end of the Union line. Chamberlain was told by his commander, General Meade, you must hold this at all costs. Never withdraw, never retreat. This is vital. General Lee on the other side of the line could see that it was the vulnerable point and he focused his soldiers on Little Round Top who attacked in wave after wave after wave. And every time the 20th Maine beat them back from their attack, the Confederates regrouped and charged again. All through that long, hot July day, Joshua Chamberlain's soldiers had to hang on longer than they ever had in a previous battle or ever thought possible until as dusk was approaching, and as another Confederate attack was building down below them, Chamberlain quickly went through his exhausted men, some of them dehydrated, some of them wounded, 
all of them weary to the point of collapse and he asked them how they were doing and he discovered that not only were they physically tired but they were almost all out of ammunition. And so if, if you know the story, Joshua Chamberlain made a most fateful decision. Men, he said, this is going to end now for better or worse. And then he gave that dramatic two-word command. Fix bayonets. And they did. And contrary to all the expectations of the advancing southerners, the men from Maine rose up from behind their rocks and trees and they charged downhill into the Confederates and the Confederate wave broke and was shattered. And the Union army was saved. Had Lee's troops succeeded, they would have turned the line, they would have wiped out the supplies, destroyed the cannons, and probably been able to fire at the backs of all the rest of the northern soldiers. But because that small group of men were prepared for a long battle, well, historians will tell you, it was that which allowed the Battle of Gettysburg to be won by the Union forces. And if Gettysburg had turned out differently, the Civil War would have turned out differently. And if the Civil War had ended differently, the future of the United States, and in fact even of the world for the next century and a half, would have been dramatically different. All because one small group of men were prepared to fight the long battle. That's my first principle then. Principle number two. Be prepared for the victory to be partial rather than total. Because in fact, to be candid about it, every single victory on earth is temporary because the earth is temporary and our bodies are temporary. Why, in this account, we find that Israel had a great victory and for a number of years they had no more war. But a couple generations later, the nation having drifted away from God, another attacker came. And this time God said, okay, you're going to have to face some consequences. And a very different outcome occurred. It is true for all of us. When we receive a victory from God, it's not permanent. It's not eternal. Mary Neal orthopedic surgeon, was here two weeks ago. She told her unforgettable story. Uh, she had literally died, was brain dead for a long period of time, and then came back to life and has spent the year since then understanding what happened and what she saw when she is convinced she was in heaven. And then Jesus said, you have to go back into your body. I've got some work for you yet to do. Mary Neal, who won this amazing victory over death, nevertheless will tell us very blatantly, I know I'm going to die again someday. And that time, it will be my one-way trip to heaven. The fact is that every person who's cured, every cancer that's in remission, is a temporary partial victory. Why, those of you who have had orthopedic surgery can relate. A couple years ago, I had a torn rotator cuff. I couldn't do anything with my dominant arm. I got uh, surgery. I did the long rehab. And now today, I've got a good arm. But it's not perfect. It's not a 20 years arm. And I guarantee you, I will never pitch for the Red Sox. I just can't do it. It's a partial victory. I've got a shoulder back, but it's not perfect. Be prepared and be thankful for partial victories. If you've got a marriage that's struggling and you see some improvement, don't expect it to be perfect. Just be grateful for any partial victory. So that's principle number two. And now principle number three. Be prepared for God to have a different plan than you have. You may have figured out what he's going to do. He may do it a different way. Here's an example from just this past Monday night. We had on this stage Alex Kendrick, who is a Christian filmmaker. He and his uh, brother, uh, who were involved in a church in Albany, Georgia, decided that uh, they could make a film. And it had a wonderful Christian message. And Alex Kendrick believed that this message needed to be shared with other people. If you know anything about the film industry, you know that independent filmmakers don't have a chance of getting their films in theaters unless a big corporation 
offers to distribute the film. That's the only way you can get it in theaters. So Alex Kendrick decided that he needed to take this into his hands. He flew to LA, he went to every uh, studio in Hollywood knocking on the door, asking them to distribute his film. And every single one of them said, are you kidding? A film about God and faith, there's no market for that. And so he came home very discouraged. Oh, by the way, it just happened that before he flew to L.A., one of the last things he did was to send a letter uh, to a uh, Christian film distributing company that had the rights to a song they wanted to uh, put as background music in the film, and they had to get a letter of permission. It's a standard procedure. So uh, he had uh, called up the CEO of this company in Nashville called Provident Music, and uh, this, that CEO said, well, send me a DVD, uh, but we don't give permission until we see what you're going to use it for, and so he shipped it off. It was kind of an uncut version, pretty raw, but he forgot about it. When he returned from Hollywood with all those slam doors in his face, he was shocked to get a phone call from the CEO of Providence Music in Nashville saying, I love the film and I passed it on to management of our parent corporation and they're interested in helping to distribute it. Who's your parent corporation, Alex said? Sony Pictures who indeed distributed his film and the ones that followed and allowed them to be seen and have an incredible impact and a great box office success. And Alex never thought about that. He actually did not contact Sony Pictures. He never thought about that. But God had a different plan. Do any of you have a story about having a plan, but God having a different plan that turned out to be a better one? Well, these are three principles that I humbly offer to you as my perspective on this issue of fighting the battles of life. It's my hope that you've been encouraged by reading the story in Scripture and seeing how one person and the people who are under his leadership responded to that battle with prayer, with trust in God, with surrender to him, and how God's power overcame. I want to encourage you and assure you that if you have given your life to the Lord, whenever the next battle comes, face it, confident that it's not your battle. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you come alongside us in all those struggles of life. Lord, we want you to be the Lord we want to surrender ourselves to you and we want to learn how to trust in you rather than in our own strength and resources that we might discover for ourselves today as people 3,000 years ago did that in fact you will fight for us and that the battle is not ours but the Lord's. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.